Family Values Between Neoliberalism and the New Social Conservatism by Melinda Cooper. This is the second part of Chapter 7. Mediating Structures, an Agenda for Faith-Based Welfare. In 1977, the sociologist Peter Berger and the theologian Richard John Newhouse collaborated on a slim book to empower people that would go on to play a central role in the project of conservative welfare reform. Published by the Enterprise Institute as the first in a series of studies on mediating structures, the text rehearsed many of the familiar neoconservative grievances against the Great Society expansion of welfare, but distinguished itself by according a central role to religion in any future reform of the welfare state. Reflecting back on the successes and failures of the war on poverty, Berger and Newhouse praised Johnson for bringing churches back into the fold on the welfare state, while faulting federal agencies for suppressing the unique moral authority of religion. Johnson's experiment in decentralization, however laudable, had been implemented at the worst possible time, a moment in history when the Supreme Court and federal welfare agencies were overrun by progressive elites intent on regulating from above every aspect of welfare provision. The progressive orientation of federal welfare law had stripped the welfare state of its overarching legit legitimating function, that of sustaining civic virtue, and fatally undermined the natural moral structures of church, community, and family. Without institutionally reliable processes of mediation, the political order becomes detached from the values and realities of individual life. Deprived of its moral foundation, the political order is delegitimated. Delegitimated. The dominant religious charities, argued Berger and Newhouse, were hardly less culpable. These institutions had lost any credibility they once had by failing to contest the increasingly hostile rulings of the Supreme Court and ceding to the secularizing imperatives of the state. The loss of religious and cultural distinctiveness is abetted by the dynamics of professionalization within the religious institutions and by the failure of the churches either to support their agencies or to insist that public policy respect their distinctiveness. Large religious charities such as Lutheran Social Services were at risk of becoming quasi-governmental agencies through the powers of funding, certification, licensing, and the like. Thus, even as religious charities had assumed a much greater public presence in the field of welfare services, religion as such had been progressively reprivatized and banished from the public square. In particular, Berger and Newhouse denounced the mainline Protestant denominations for their complicity in this process. By touting a doctrine of religious freedom that negated the very possibility of public religiosity, the mainline churches had compromised their capacity to contribute anything of value in the social services arena. American liberals are virtually faultless in their commitment to the religious liberty of individuals, they remarked. But the liberty, but the liberty to be defended is always that of privatized religion. In a book published a few years later, The Naked Public Square, Newhouse would formulate this critique in even more strident terms. The delegitimation of religious authority, he now asserted, was not primarily the fault of the liberal bureaucratic elites or the anti-authoritarian New Left, but of the mainline churches themselves. The churches then cannot stand aloof from the gathering legitimation crisis in our public life. They are in large part responsible for it. By accepting Supreme Court rulings, banishing prayers from public schools and outlawing sectarianism, and welfare services, by assenting to the new privacy jurisprudence around sexuality that culminated in the Roe versus Wade decision, the mainline churches had ensured their own political irrelevance. The public program of many mainline churches, Newhouse commented as acerbically, I've never heard that word before, is hardly distinguishable from the program of the Civil Liberties Union for the elimination of religious influence from American life. Thus, while private rights to sexual freedom were now being wielded against the prerogatives of family and faith, 
religion itself was being deprived of its proper institutional freedoms. Faced with what they understood as a wholesale crisis of legitimation, Berger and Newhouse called for a radical new interpretation of constitutional law. The wall of separation between church and state, Jefferson's phrase, not the constitutions, is a myth long overdue for thorough rethinking, they announced. Although declaring themselves deeply committed to the religious clauses of the First Amendment, they insisted that the prohibition against establishing a religion of state should not be understood as requiring absolute separationism. Rather, religious freedom should be interpreted as authorizing the free exercise of all denominations in the public square. The enduring influence of Berger and Newhouse's proposal for welfare reform can perhaps be attributed to the fact that it's so expertly mediated between the neoliberal and neoconservative uh, visions of the social. Like many neoliberal advocates of welfare devolution, Berger and Newhouse were not prepared to abandon Johnson's experiment in political decentralization, but argued instead that it had not been pursued far enough. In essence, what they called for was a more radical federalism and more comprehensive devolution of powers from the federal government to the states and from the states to civil society. At the same time, however, Berger and Newhouse were adamant that the devolution of government responsibilities should not be tantamount to dismantling the welfare state. In this respect, their position converged with that of the neoconservatives, who remained attached to the fundamental principles of the New Deal welfare state, even while they denounced the terrible moral failures of Johnson's great society. Partisan rhetoric aside, few people seriously envisage dismantling the welfare state. The serious debate is over how, to, over, over how and to what extent it should be expanded. Yet they offered a much more creative institutional approach to the problem of welfare reform than the neoconservatives were able to come up with. Berger and Newhouse's specific contribution to this debate was to be found in the concept of mediating structures. Welfare reform had most chance of success, they argued, if it were channeled through the mediating structures of civil society, defined as those institutions standing or standing between the individual in his private life and the large institutions of public life. Rather than dictating the administrative form of welfare provision from on high, the federal government would be better advised to delegate its services to pre-existing quasi-natural institutions such as neighborhood, family, church, and voluntary association. And rather than enunciating laws from above, laws that too often had unintended and deleterious consequences, the government should authorize these institutions, in particular religious institutions, to dictate their own forms of legitimacy. In this way, moral authority would not be lost, but transferred downward and reinvested in the mediating structures of church, community, and family. Instead of diluting the moral uh, purpose of welfare, decentralization would reinforce it by delegating authority to the most experienced enforcers of moral law. It was clear from the very start that this reform agenda would necessitate an ambitious campaign of administrative and legal reform. Berger and Newhouse were among the first to understand the importance of constitutional law to the project of implementing faith-based welfare, and Newhouse was the first theologian to translate the public religiosity of the new Christian right into a comprehensive new doctrine of religious freedom one that is fast becoming hegemonic in recent church-state jurisprudence. As early as the Naked Public Square, 1984, Newhouse called on religious organizations to refuse the prohibition against religious expression enunciated by recent Supreme Court decisions, urging them instead to openly embrace the sectarian option. Newhouse's vision of religious freedom was radical, even insurrectionary, Ultimately, he saw religion as participating in an order of truth destined to override and annul the laws of the state whenever the latter came into conflict with moral law. Very basic notions of religious freedom, he announced, depend upon an understanding of religion as the bearer of transcendent truth to which the nation is accountable. Religious freedom, in this view, bestows the right to assert absolute moral law over and above federal law. 
In key respects, the personal trajectories of Berger and Newhouse bear witness to the historical vicissitudes of American Protestantism, Protestantism and its evolving relationship to the state. Former Lutherans who had been actively involved in the civil rights movement in the 1960s, both Newhouse and Berger had by the 1970s turned against the countercultural New Left to embrace both a theological variant of neoconservatism and the anti-tax neoliberalism of the Reagan Revolution. Newhouse began his career as a Lutheran pastor in a predominantly black church located in the Bedford Stuyvesant slum of New York. Alongside many of his fellow mainline clergy, Newhouse was an active, even militant participant in the civil rights and anti-war movements. Together with Rabbi Abraham Joshua Eschel and Father Daniel Berrigan, he co-founded Clergy and Laymen Concerned About Vietnam, or CalCav, in 1965. An interdenominational group committed to prophetic Protestant and, co- and conscientious objection that later counted Mar- Martin Luther King among its members. Berger, a Lutheran layman and self described conservative, was also involved in the organization Martin Luther King among its members. I feel like I skipped a line, but I don't think I did. Berger, a Lutheran layman, and self-described conservative was also involved in the organization. By the late 1960s, however, Newhouse and Berger were increasingly uncomfortable with the direction in which the left was heading. The civil rights movement was rapidly losing ground to militant black power, the anti-war movement was giving way to the countercultural new left, and the new left itself was splintering into various liberationist tendencies centered on sexuality and feminism. At his most militant, Newhouse had endorsed the religious tradition of conscientious objection as an ethically justified response to the abuse of state power, but he had never questioned the, the legitimacy of the nation itself, much less the family. The new social movements were doing precisely that. The anti-patriotism of the black power and anti-war movements, the anti-authoritarianism of the new generation of student activists, and above all, the critique of family that was so central to the women's movement and gay liberation convinced Berger and Newhouse that they no longer had anything in common with the left. As they turned against these new expressions of the left, Berger and Newhouse were led inevitably to question the social activism of the mainline churches in which they themselves had been so heavily involved. Like many others who gravitated towards the new religious right around this time, Newhouse's exit from the mainline National Council of Churches was galvanized by the Roe v. Wade decision of 1973 and a growing sense that the Supreme Court's recognition of a right to privacy authorized the liberation of women from the family. In an early reflection on the liberalization of abortion laws at the state level, Newhouse drew an, an analogy between the rights of the unborn and the civil rights long denied to African Americans an amalgam of fetal and civic states of victimhood that would soon become common sense on the religious right. By the mid-1970s, Newhouse officially withdrew from Calcav and began to publicly distance himself from the mainline churches, whose social progressivism, however moderate, he saw as somehow complicit with the political and theological decline of the left in general. In 1975, Newhouse and Berger brought together a group of prominent church leaders to pen the Hartford Appeal for Theological Affirmation, an anti-modernist manifesto that viciously denounced the social gospel activism of the mainline churches. At this point, Newhouse began to consider himself a critical but sympathetic observer of the emerging Christian right. Although he despaired of its populism, he also sought, through his writing and institutional work, to channel its eschatological, prophetic fervor into a more respectable, politically palatable form. By the late 1970s, Newhouse had positioned himself as a mediator between the new Christian right and the neoconservative movement, on the one hand, and between conservative Catholics and evangelicals on the other. In 1981, together with the Catholic neoconservative Michael Novak and the anti-communist social democrat Penn Kemble, he confounded the Institute on Religion and Democracy, or he co-founded the Institute on Religion and Democracy. 
Espousing the cause of religious freedom, the Institute sought to undermine the influence of the National Council of Churches at home, while also countering the alliance between Catholic liberation theology and communism in Central America. Newhouse went on to found the Institute on Religion and Public Life, dedicated to the cause of religious freedom and domestic politics, and its associated journal, First Things, which published works by neoconservatives, conservative evangelicals, and Catholics. Having abandoned the mainline Lutheran Church and converted to Catholicism in 1990, Newhouse was instrumental in, in consolidating the alliance between evangelicals and Catholics. Together with, with his friend Charles Colson, the director of Prison Fellowship Ministries, Newhouse helped draft the Ecumen Ecumenical Pledge Evangelicals and Catholics together, setting out the terms of a shared political and legal agenda to restore moral law. The document was notable for uniting Catholics and evangelicals around the twin causes of religious freedom, a concept endorsed by the Second Vatican Council, but with deep roots in the American Protestant imagination and the right to life. Once unique to Catholics, but now passionately embraced by evangelicals, Religion, it announced, is foundational in our legal order, but Americans were drifting away from, away from, were often explicitly defying the constituting truths of this experiment in ordered liberty. The restoration of this origin, originary constitutional order would require a vigorous campaign to defend religious freedom in all aspects of American life. The document went on to carefully explicate the mutually exclusive relationship between religious freedom and moral tolerance. While the American Protestant tradition is defined by its tolerance for, for dissident faiths, religious freedom itself demands a radical intolerance via v the non-normative, that is, a moral expression of sexuality. Every effort must be made to cultivate the morality, morality of honesty, law observance, work, caring, chastity, mutual respect between the sexes, and readiness for marriage, parenthood, and family, the authors proclaim. We reject the claim that, in any or all of these areas, tolerance requires the promotion of moral equivalence between the normative and the deviant. Here we find a lucid articulation of the new politics of religious freedom and a clear acknowledgement of its prohibitive intent. Ultimately, it is a shared respect for moral law and a shared desire to outlaw certain expressions of sexuality that allows evangelicals and Catholics to set aside their doctrinal differences and embark on a militant campaign to defend the place of religion in the public square. The normative language of deviance and pathology forged by the 19th and 20th century medical and social sciences is here subsumed within an older vocabulary of religious law and deemed profane. Evangelicals are in fact moving closer to Catholics in their willingness to embrace a Thomist or Aristotelian theology of natural law that redefines sexual and gender deviance as a crime against a divine order of nature. Promoted by the Vatican under John Paul II and weaponized as an instrument of legal casuistry by the so-called new natural law scholars, the Thomist philosophy of nature is presented as the most promising means of contesting the anti-normative claims of gender theory in the public domain. This it does not, this it does not by engaging the debate on the terrain of normativity, but by appealing to a higher order of natural divine law that tolerates no sin. Religious freedom, as defined by the new religious right, is not incidentally or marginally intolerant of sexual immorality. Rather, as Tocqueville intuited, it is defined by its absolute desire to annul such practices and sees itself as authorized by divine law to do so. Peter Berger, for his part, belonged to a generation of post-war sociologists who accepted Weber's theses on secularization as something close to historical fact. But Berger was also personally critical of the demoralizing influence of secularization on American society and privately nostalgic for a time when religion played a much more public and prohibitive role in social life. In a 1971 address to the Consultation on Church Union, 
a coalition of liberal Protestant denominations formed several years previously with the aim of creating a single ecumenical church. Berger publicly qualified his early work, suggesting that he and his fellow sociologists may have been mistaken into confidently projecting the secularization of modern society into the long-term future. Rather than, a, rather than a continuation of historical trends, Berger suggested, what was becoming increasingly evident was a widespread and deepening hunger for religious answers among people of many different sorts, pointing to a possibly powerful reversal of the secularization process. Whatever the outcome of these trends, Berger was doubtful that the mainline churches in their current form were capable of responding to the new desire for public religion. The beneficiaries of this shift were more likely to be the evangelical churches, which had never confused their mission with that of the secular state. If there is going to be a, a renaissance, renaissance, that's not renaissance, renaissance of religion, its bearers will not be the people who have been falling all over each other to be relevant to modern man. Ages of faith are not marked by dollar by dialogue, but by proclamation. Berger would spend the rest of his intellectual career revising his earlier work on secular pluralism and studying the political implications of, res of resurgent evangelicalism. As director of the Institute of Culture, Religion, and World Affairs, Cura, at Boston University, Berger worked on a revised version of Weber's Protestant Ethic. Pointing to the worldwide resurgence of evangelical and Pentecostal Protestantisms, Berger argued that born-again varieties of Christianity were uniquely attuned to the conditions of neoliberal economic reform in both the United States and the Global South. The Protestant ethic was on the march again, Berger insisted, but unlike the early modern Calvinism that informed Weber's analysis, the evangelical resurgence did not entail the progressive secularization of the world. Rather, it was destined to play its role on the historical stage as an agent of profound desecularization. Written at a time when the religious right was just beginning to flex its muscles, Berger and New Houses, to empower people, exerted an extraordinary influence over social policy debate throughout the following decades. Their intervention can be read as the blueprint for charitable choice, not only in the obvious sense that it was repeatedly referenced by the architects of faith-based welfare, but also because its concept of mediating structures lucidly prefigured the model of delegated service provision and outsourced moral authoritarianism that informed Clinton's welfare reform. The Christian libertarian Marvin Olosky may have reached a wider popular audience, but his prescriptions for a system of entirely private church charity were unrealistic in the extreme and much less predictive of future welfare reform. Berger and Newhouse's proposals had the advantage of appealing to both neoliberals and social conservatives. The Heritage Foundation fellow and neoliberal strategist Stuart Butler saw mediating structures as a way of achieving multiple pragmatic ends. The delegation of welfare to religious nonprofits would undercut the power of allegedly liberal federal welfare agencies. It would defund the left by diverting government contracts from left wing to conservative nonprofits. Combined with the use of vouchers, it would reconcile the church and the free market. And finally, it would help to reduce welfare spending by contracting with religious charities that were already partly funded by private donations and could mobilize vast armies of unpaid labor. The concept of mediating structures was equally appealing to religious conservatives such as Gary Bauer and Paul Weyrich, who saw it as a way of transforming, not defunding, the welfare state and infusing it with traditional moral values. If both parties were forced to make concessions in the actual policy implementation process, the idea of mediating structures appeared to offer the perfect compromise. A long, a long march through the institutions. Religious organizations continued to build up their presence in the social service sector throughout the 1980s, but in a context that was very different from that of the previous decade. 
whereas religious nonprofits had been actively included within the reach of an ever-expanding welfare state under Johnson's War on Poverty, they were now expected to substitute for services that were being eroded or starved of funding under the neoliberal policies of the Reagan administration. The austerity politics of welfare devolution now replaced Johnson's fully funded project in welfare decentralization as the guiding rationale for the growth of the nonprofit sector. In most instances, the budget cuts carried out by Regan and his successors did not eradicate services to the poor altogether, but simply transferred them to cheaper third-party prov providers. Religious nonprofits, in particular, were considered ideal partners of the state because of their reliance on unpaid volunteer labor and their access to alternative sources of funding. For this reason, religious charities expanded greatly as a result of the selective dismantling of the welfare state, becoming fully integrated within the fabric of government social service contracts at a time when the old public welfare institutions were being disassembled. The actual deinstitutionalization movement benefited religious nonprofits in a very direct way. When public health activists of the left called for the deinstitutionalization of the mentally ill, and disabled throughout the 1960s, they did not, for the most part, consider the problem of building and maintaining alternative services in the long term. It was assumed that mental health patients would end up in the community, but few had really thought through the complexities of caring for the ill once they left the institutional environment of the asylum. Instead, conservative, denominational religious charities were some of the first to respond to the very obvious and urgent needs of those who were released from state institutions. When in 1975, the courts ordered the state of New York to close the infamous Willowbrook State School, a home for children with intellectual disabilities, it was at a loss what to do with former patients who had no relatives to return to and were incapable of caring for themselves. Having contra or contacted the established Protestant foster care agencies to no avail, the state ended up delegating the creation of group homes to Catholic and Orthodox Jewish charities that saw care for the disabled as a logical consequence of their anti-abortion politics. Without other viable options in sight, the state was prepared to overlook the pervasively sectarian nature of these homes. The experience was subsequently replicated across the country. In this way, notes historian Peter Dobkin Hall, New York led the nation in creating community-based care and treatment for the dependent and disabled. Its system of non-profit group homes, many of them faith-based, supported by variable mixes of federal, state, and local funding, in many cases combined with traditional sources of private revenues, foundation grants and individual and corporate donations, would become a paradigm for the reorganization of social services throughout the country. What looked like the deinstitutionalization of the disciplinary asylum, then, from another angle, could be seen as the reinstitutionalization of religion, a process whereby religious charities resumed their once central role in the management of poverty, but this time fully integrated into the contractual networks and budgetary calculations of the state. During the same period, religious nonprofits responded to rising rates of homelessness by expanding or resuming traditional operations, such as running homeless shelters and soup kitchens. In the first year of his administration, when the U.S. was entering the worst recession since the Great Depression, Reagan convinced Congress to freeze social spending on the poor. The Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act of 1981 suspended budget increases for Medicaid, unemployment compensation, and housing assistance, with substantial cuts to food stamps and child nutrition services. Implemented at a time when unemployment levels in, all, in once thriving industrial cities were reaching double-digit figures and deinstitutionalization had left many mentally ill people without shelter, the budget cuts brought a visible influx of newly homeless people onto the streets. Traditional charities, including many religious organizations, were some of the first to respond to the crisis, often at the behest of local authorities who were working with greatly reduced block grants from the federal government. Consequently, faith-based homeless shelters, food banks, and soup kitchens mushroomed across the country in the space of a few years. 
the old evangelical rescue missions that had existed in almost every city center since the late 19th century found themselves overwhelmed around them. Established charities such as the Salvation Army and Catholic Charities multiplied their emergency shelter contracts with state and municipal authorities. Churches, churches, convents, and synagogues opened their pews and basements to provide overnight shelter to the homeless during the winter. When the federal government was finally roused to action after several years of, of prevarication, it assigned religious charities an active role in the administration and provision of services. In 1983, Congress authorized an emergency food and shelter program to be administered by the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA. The act simultaneously created a national board composed of six charitable agencies, including the United Way of America, the American Red Cross, the Salvation Army, Catholic Charities USA, the Council of Jewish Federations, and the National Council of Churches that were charged with the task of distributing funds to local service providers. When the program was reauthorized under the McKinney Homeless Assistance Act of 1987, Regan reiterated his intention that charitable organizations, including those with religious affiliation, should continue to play a vital role in the delivery of services contemplated in this legislation. The gradual institutionalization of this emergency response system has had the simultaneous, although less noted, effect of consolidating the role of religious charities in the provision of social services. Collaborations of this kind were replicated at state and municipal levels. In New York City, Mayor Ed Koch appealed to religious charities to supplement the city's overcrowded shelter system in the early 1980s. The result was Partnership for the Homeless, an umbrella organization that mushroomed from three religious charities at its inception in 1982 to include 120 institutions by 2001. With a reported capacity of more than 1,000 beds, most of them located in the basements of churches or synagogues, Cox's call to religious char uh, charities was a calculated response to the interventions of a powerful urban reform movement that advocated for long-term, non-charitable solutions to urban poverty and had recently won notable successes in the courts. In 1979, Robert Hayes, an attorney who would go on to found the Coalition for the Homeless, brought a lawsuit against the Koch administration, citing the inadequacies of its homeless shelter system. In its ruling on the case Callahan v. Carey in 1981, the state Supreme Court Justice concluded that the right to adequate shelter was inscribed in the New York State Constitution and ordered Koch to provide 750 more beds to homeless men. The case was followed by countless other court orders to improve the shelter system. Rather than dip into municipal budgets to expand the existing shelter system or invest in public housing, Koch turned to religious nonprofits, a response that would be repeated across the country. National surveys conducted for the Urban Institute in 1995 and 1999 found that religious charities operated the majority of soup kitchens and over one-third of homeless shelters, although some argue that these figures underestimate the size of the religious contribution. These charities receive various levels of local, state, and federal aid, depending on their doctrinal and historical relationship to the state. The large religious charities such as the Salvation Army, Catholic Charities USA, and Lutheran Social Services have accepted federal aid since the 1960s or earlier and remain some of the largest nonprofit contractors with the state, although their private sources of funding often match or outweigh what they receive from the government. Many other religious charities receive various kinds of assistance from the government including direct financial aid, or in, the case of, or in the case of most soup kitchens, surplus commodities donated by the Department of Agriculture. Evangelical rescue missions remain the most independent of religious charities, for the most part refusing to receive government aid, except in the form of tax exemptions. The presence of faith-based organizations varies on a function of urban and, and regional welfare histories, a city such as New York, which has the largest municipal shelter system in the country, 
is still largely dependent on the thousands of emergency beds offered by religious charities. In the South and Midwest, and in many medium and small cities across the country, faith-based organizations are often the only providers of emergency shelter. Even in a city such as New York, faith-based shelters may dominate services for certain client groups, such as the young. The resurgence of the religious factor in social welfare sits uneasily with the analytics of power we have inherited from such prominent theorists of the social as Michel Foucault and Irving Goffman. One investigator into the state of religious homeless shelters post-deinstitutionalization found a new kind of institution every bit as totalizing as Goffman's infamous asylum. This big city shelter for the homeless run by a Catholic religious order reminded the author of the massive and regimented environment in institutions that she mistakenly believed no longer existed after the acclaimed deinstitutionalization of America. Although the shelter did not engage in direct religious instruction, its semi-permanent guests were subject to a close regime of curfews and petty sanctions, constantly serving to remind them of the conditional nature of the charity being offered. Another study speaks of the hyper-institutionalization of long-term residents in an, inv- in an evangelical rescue mission, whose exposure to continuous religious exhortation and limited contact with the outside world renders them fit for little else than missionary work in the shelter after their release. Evangelical missions practice evangelical missions practice overt forms of proselytization, holding their clients in an unspoken pact whereby food and shelter are exchanged for evangelism. Gospel services are repeated before breakfast, lunch, and dinner as a condition of receiving care. And clients who do not express a devoted or at least passive attention may be summarily evicted from the premises. Somewhere between these two extremes lies the Salvation Army, a state-endorsed evangelical institution that is also one of the oldest and largest religious contractors in the country. Inspired by a 19th century evangelical ethic eschewing the wealth gospel in favor of savings and hard work, the Salvation Army schools its homeless clients in a militaristic regime of self-discipline that implicitly attributes social failure to personal sin. Without completely displacing the normative disciplines of the social and human sciences, faith-based social services deploy a very different vocabulary of rule. These services do not seek to normalize or rehabilitate so much as redeem. They speak the language of sin rather than deviance or perversion. If they are undoubtedly reliant on practices of confession, this is in the overt Christian sense of religious witness. Theorists versed in the historical taxonomies of Foucault have trouble recognizing that contemporary power might speak the language of moral law, sin, and redemption as much, if not more, than normativity. Foucault's historiography tends to downplay the influence of religion in the formation of the modern social state, treating it as a residue of early modern power or early modern forms of power or in his later work, a horizon of ethical practice somehow impervious to the coercive machinations of the state or capital. Yet, Christian practices of redemption were never aliened to the poor law tradition of poverty relief, which in its early 19th century iteration was informed by both classical economic liberalism and evangelical theology. Faith-based welfare translates the neoliberal ethic of family responsibility into the religious conservative idiom of personal sin, immorality, and redemption. If you are homeless, it is because you have failed before God. If you are in prison or unemployed, it is because you have neglected to assume your personal responsibilities as a father or have chosen the path of sin. Once one has accepted these premises, rehabilitation can be achieved only through a process of process of spiritual regeneration or rebirth, and this in turn demands intensive training in the practice of responsible family life. Faith-based welfare can be said to practice a form of power that is not so much normalizing or rehabilitative 
as intimately legislative and orthopractic, exhorting its clients to perform their deference to moral law, even in the absence of any true change of heart. As Tocqueville and Beaumont noted of the religious prisons of early 19th century America, evangelical instruction was not always able to instill a genuine respect for moral law among prisoners, yet it was almost always successful in eliciting moral habits. And this orthopractic effect was perhaps just as useful as an exercise of power. Although initially conceived as a temporary response to poverty, the emergency shelter and food system has progressively stabilized and now functions as a kind of para-welfare state supplementing the permanent budget shortfalls of local authorities. Federal programs that were enacted as emergency measures in the early 1980s have subsequently been reauthorized many times over, transforming them into permanent fixtures of the social service landscape. In an important sense, notes sociologist Janet Popendike, Popendike, the ambitious anti-poverty programs envisaged by the Great Society have been replaced by a system of domestic humanitarian relief designed to manage, manage rather than eradicate the problems of homelessness and hunger. The notion of a permanent emergency is certainly unattractive, she writes, but a close look at the lifestyles available to many poor people reveals what might be termed a state of chronic emergency. Medical care from the emergency room because they are uninsured, a bed in the emergency shelter because they are without permanent residence, food from the emergency food provider on a regular basis. This slow sedimentation of sedimentation, sediment, what? This slow sedimentate, sed, fuck. The slow sedimentation of emergency relief structures has substantially reinvigorated the social role of charities, which now find themselves regularly factored into fiscal calculations as a cushion against predictable budget cuts. Religious charities that had once been peripheral to the welfare structures of the New Deal have now become indispensable components of federal and state anti-poverty programs. What we are witnessing here is not a return to private charity as it existed before the New Deal, but rather the implementation of a form of structural charity, structural in the sense that it is fully aided and embedded by the state, but charitable in the sense that it retains the discretionary, unpredictable, and ad hoc nature of private philanthropy. The New Religious Freedom, Christian Public Interest Litigation as conservative religious organizations increased their presence in the social welfare field, the Christian right simultaneously adopted a new strategy of litigating church-state issues in the courts with a view to expanding its institutional freedoms. The 1990s saw a proliferation of conservative Christian law firms dedicated to reshaping church-state relations through the use of public interest litigation. These firms included the American Center for Law and Justice, founded by Pat Robertson in 1999, uh, 1990, the Christian Legal Society Center for Law and Religious Freedom, the Rutherford Institute, the Alliance Defense Fund, now, re now renamed the Alliance Defending Freedom, Liberty Council, and the Catholic, Catholic Affiliated Beckett Fund. Together, these organizations have used the courts to forge a new jurisprudence of religious freedom that has successfully challenged prevailing constitutional doctrine concerning church-state relations and progressively eroded the established prohib prohibition against the public funding of pervasively sectarian welfare providers. The turn to litigation was an unexpected change in direction for the Christian right, which had traditionally eschewed the, judi the judiciary in favor of the electoral and legislative arenas and had long decreed the left's disproportionate influence in the Supreme Court. When Jerry Falwell founded the Moral Majority in 1978, he wanted to convey the idea that evangelicals were a majoritarian electoral bloc whose power had been usurped by a small group of liberal elites huddled in, a federal, in federal bureaucracies and the Supreme Court. Christian conservatives greeted the election of Ronald Reagan as a sign of imminent victory, fully expecting the representatives in Congress to push through with a comprehensive legislative agenda to restore religion in public schools and overturn Roe v. Wade. 
During this period, the Christian right focused its energies almost exclusively on the legislative and executive branches of government, engaging in elaborate campaigns to mobilize voting blocs and lobby members of Congress. The tone was triumphalist. Christians were a majority reclaiming America from theological and social ruins at the hands of the Supreme Court. In its first few years, the moral majority did meet with some success. Not only did it push through the Hyde Amendment to limiting the public funding of abortions through Medicaid, but it also managed to paralyze federal action in the face of the AIDS epidemic for much of the 1980s. But this was far from the legislative counter-revolution that Christian conservatives had been hoping for, and the victories were coming at a much slower pace by the end of the decade. By the 1990s, the Christian right was forced to adopt a more incremental, less triumphalist approach, approach to political change. Falwell's influence was rapidly being eclipsed by new groups such as the Christian Coalition, created as a nonprofit organization shortly after Pat Robertson's failed bid for presidency in 1989. These new voices on the Christian right presented themselves in very different terms, as representatives of a persecuted minority rather than a majority claiming its rightful place in the seats of power. Consciously adopting the language of the civil rights movement, the executive director of the Christian Coalition, Ralph Reed, likened the plight of Christians at the close of the 20th century to that of African Americans at mid-century. Christians were systematically discriminated against in public life denied equal protection of the law, and deprived of civil liberties, such as freedom of religious expression. Their collective condition was comparable to that of the unborn. The ultimate minority, who had been stripped of the most fundamental of civil rights, the right to life. These rhetorical moves not only managed to position Christians as victims of system, systemic discrimination, but they also served the, the strategic objective of neutralizing the all-too-recent history of racism among Southern white evangelicals. Under the direction of Ralph Reed, the Christian Coalition made concerted efforts to bring African Americans into the fold of the pro-life movement, at the same time urging white evangelicals to acknowledge and seek atonement for their complicity in the racial segregation of the American South. Reed's... Reed's... Reed's efforts at building a trans-denominational and interracial coalition around the civil rights of Christians heralded a new era in the strategizing of the religious right. Henceforth, Catholic and evangelical conservatives would seek to downplay racial and doctrinal differences in order to form a united bloc against sexual immorality. And as racial differences were muted, the language of civil rights would be irrigated by white Christians as a way of promoting the idea that Christians were subject to a universal condition of um, minoritization. Beyond these coalitional and public relations strategies, however, the adoption of civil rights rhetoric signaled a real change in legal and political methods. Under the influence of the Christian coalition, the religious right abandoned its, its exclusive focus on majoritarian institutions and instead turned to test case litigation in the courts, a method that had long been favored by the liberal and progressive left. In a book published in 1993, The Turning Tide, Pat Robertson called on Christians to borrow the weapons that had been used by the civil rights movement in the 1960s. Civil dis civil disobedience and public interest litigation. Christian conservatives had long decreed the influence of groups such as the ACLU and NAACP in the Supreme Court, holding them responsible for the rampant secularization of American life in the 1960s. Without abandoning these grievances, the new Christian right has subsequently adopted the legal methods of the left almost wholesale, using a missy curie Amici Curie and judicial president to pave the way for future legislative reform. Beginning in the 1990s, notes Stephen Brown, litigating firms associated with the Christian right have patterned both their courtroom and extra courtroom efforts after strategies pioneered by the ACLU and AAC, or NAACP and American Jewish Congress, 
artfully repurposing the precedents established by the liberal left to establish a secular jurisprudence of religious freedom. <clears throat> For the most part, then, these firms have sought to expand the judicial accommodation of religion not by direct reference to the religion cl clauses of the First Amendment, but, re but by reworking the arguments around discrimination and freedom of expression once monopolized by their enemies. In a strange twist of history, the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment that once helped dismantle segregation, much to the ch chagrin of white Southern fundamentalists, is now being invoked to defend the right to religious freedom, understood as the right of Christians to be free from discri discrimination. Stranger still, the right to freedom of expression established by the ACLU's landmark obscenity cases in the 1960s is now being invoked to defend the right to public expression of religion. Not only have Christian litigators borrowed the tools of their enemies, but they also have turned these tools against them, deploying religious freedom to annul the jurisprudence of sexual freedom and religious anti-discrimination laws to override the gender-based protections of a previous era. Christian legal firms are now no longer content to maintain defensive positions. In the past few decades, their courtroom victories have steadily eroded the separationist doctrine of religious freedom that prevailed in the post-war period. In particular, Christian litigators have fought for and won ever greater powers of public exemption for religious service providers by building on the precedent of conscience clause legislation, first granted to Catholic hospitals after the Roe v. Wade decision of 1973. In different contexts, religious institutions and individual believers have been authorized to invoke, to invoke conscious clauses, allowing them to refuse to provide abortion, sterilization, or contraception, or to deny service to homosexuals. Christian law firms have established precedents excusing religious organizations from employment discrimination laws labor laws, workplace health insurance laws, and sexual discrimination laws. These exemptions are clearly oriented toward issues of sexual freedom, as noted by Martha Minow. Religious organizations are emphatically not exempted from civil rights laws outlawing racial discrimination, but they have received notable exemptions with respect to discrimination based on gender and sexual orientation. As redefined by the new Christian right, religious freedom has come to authorize very public expressions of moral conscience, allowing faith-based providers of government-funded services to exempt themselves from federal laws whenever their religious sensibilities are off-ended or are offended. <laughs> the moral exclusion zones established by such exemptions were bound to become ever more pervasive and claustrophobic as conservative religious providers increased their role in the provision of social services. The case of abortion services is particularly alarming. Hospitals of all kinds have undergone a large, undergone a large number of consolidations in recent decades because of managed care reforms in the health sector. Catholic hospitals have weathered these changes much better than other religious or nonprofit hospitals, and over the past few years have sealed an unprecedented number of mergers. According to a report published in 2013, Catholic-sponsored hospitals accounted for one in nine beds across the country as of 2011, with much higher ratios in some states, including Washington, Wisconsin, and Iowa. The largest Catholic health networks have continued to pursue an aggressive politics of expansion since the time of this report and are now likely to account for an even larger proportion of hospital beds. All Catholic hospitals in the United States, including most of the hospitals that have emerged with them, are governed by the ethical and religious directives issued by the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, a set of guidelines that ban elective abortion, sterilization, and contraception. These directives are sometimes interpreted to prohibit emergency contraception for women who have been raped and may limit the kinds of care available to women who have suffered miscarriages or ectopic pregnancies. Given the substantial levels of public funding that are allocated to these hospitals in the form of Medicare and Medicaid reimbursements, such practices must be understood as tackedly government-endorsed. An equally alarming development is the growing number of homeless shelters run by conservative religious organizations. Faith-based shelters have received federal funding 
um, faith-based shelters that receive federal funding are under no obligation to treat gender non-conforming clients without discrimination. And yet these same organizations have gained increasingly robust rights to freedom of religious expression in recent years. This situation is of, a, is of particular concern given that gay, bisexual, and gender non-conforming clients make up a higher portion, a high proportion of the homeless youth population. The prohibitive and exclusive effects of religious freedom here become starkly obvious as the state contracts out a graying number of essential ser social services to pervasively sectarian service providers. These same groups are empowered not merely to stigmatize nor or normalize, but to banish certain practices and expressions of sexuality from the space of the social. Charitable choice from litigation to legislation. By the early 1990s, the slow and incremental work of test case litigation relentlessly pursued by a handful of legal firms over the space of a decade had created an environment conducive to spectacular legislative interventions. After successfully litigating a series of landmark test cases in favor of accommodation, the Christian Legal Society's Center for Law and Religious Freedom, CLRF, led a coalition of nearly 60 organizations from across the political spectrum, including groups as diverse as the ACLU and the National Association of Evangelicals, to support comprehensive new legislation on religious freedom. The Religious Freedom and, Restor and Restoration Act or RFRA, received unanimous support from Congress and was signed into law by President Clinton in 1993. Responding to a recent test case that had placed limits on the Free Exercise Clause, the RFRA reinstated a strong interpretation of religious freedom and outlined a statutory right to religious exemptions from all state and federal laws, subject to the compelling interest test. According to its supporters, the act was designed simply to restore the legal status quo. In practice, the Supreme Court has interpreted it as a complete revolution in First Amendment case law, religious exemption from federal law that have never been accorded in the past. In the wake of the notorious Hobby Lobby case, most commentators have focused on the fact that RFRA has legitimated the extension of religious exemptions from churches and faith-based nonprofits to corporations. But equally noteworthy is the fact that religion here authorizes an exemption from rules covering government-sponsored health insurance, in this case, the Affordable Care Act. Recent interpretation of RFRA signals an emerging consensus that moral law trumps federal law when it comes to the provision not only of direct social welfare services, but also of social insurance. RFRA can therefore be understood as a critical legislative step toward the implementation of faith-based welfare, or faith-based welfare, even if it was not perceived as such at the time by many of its supporters. Not incidentally, the very same organization that spearheaded RFRA, the Christian Legal Society Center for Law and Religious Freedom, CLRF, also played a leading role in the passage of charitable choice legislation having first won a series of test cases in the Supreme Court. During the 1980s, lawyers associated with the CLRF managed to persuade an increasingly conservative Supreme Court to abandon the prevailing doctrine of strict church-state separation in favor of a philosophy of positive neutrality, requiring equal protection of secular and religious organizations. This trend accelerated under the Rehnquist Court, which, in the Bowen v. Kendrick decision of 1988, approved federal legislation allowing religious organizations to provide government-funded pregnancy services and sex education under the term of the Adolescent Family Life Act of 1981. The outcome of Bowen v. Kendrick was particularly encouraging to proponents of faith-based welfare because it was one of the first cases to take the constitutional issues of church-state separation out of the context of education, into the social service sector as a whole. Even more important, the case signaled a new willingness to endorse the teaching of Christian morality within federal welfare programs. In Bowen v. Kendrick, the court allowed religious organizations to provide government-funded services in an area that implicated matters of fundamental religious significance. 
These were programs that presumably could easily blur the lines between the religious, moral, and secular dimensions of teen pregnancy and sexual activity. In the wake of Bowen v. Kendrick, it appeared that the Supreme Court was ready to countenance the funding of pervasively sectarian organizations in the provision of welfare services. Building on the precedent set by Bowen v. Kendrick and buoyed by the success of RFRA legislation, the CLRF made the bold decision to propose a new set of religious provisions as part of Clinton's promised welfare reforms. Charitable choice legislation was drafted by the University of Missouri law professor Carl Esbeck, a longtime associate of the Center for Law and Religious Freedom, and sponsored by then-Senator John Ashcroft. The provision utterly transformed the role of religion within public welfare, affording faith-based organizations much greater institutional freedoms than had been allowed under the terms of Johnson's War on Poverty. Charitable Choice, in fact, responded point by point to the checklist of demands voiced by religious conservatives since the 1970s. It instructed government contractors to cease their alleged, their alleged discrimination against religious organizations and to include faith-based providers within all tenders, while at the same time exempting religious organizations themselves from anti-discrim- anti-discrimination laws in hiring. It overruled administrative regulations established by Johnson's Office of Economic Opportunity by allowing churches to display icons, scripture, and other signs of religious affiliation, and invalidated the distinction between pervasively sectarian and secular institutions. Most important, perhaps, charitable choice legislation was inserted into a comprehensive welfare reform project that was itself focused on the promotion of moral values in the family, bringing federal welfare policy into close conversation with the most conservative religious organizations for the first time in many years. In the 1970s, religious conservatives were outraged when the Supreme Court and federal government overturned the traditional police powers of states to regulate the morality of welfare recipients. With the passage of PRWORA, the federal government arrogated these police powers to itself and now instructed states to make moral education a central focus of their welfare programs. Marriage, promotion, abstinence, education, and faith-based responsible fatherhood programs are now all integral components of federal welfare policy. As the conservative commentator Leslie Linkowski observed of Bush's implementation of charitable choice, what is distinctive about the president's plan is not its reliance on proxies to provide the federal government's social services. This, as not a few worried conservatives have observed, was a key innovation of the Great Society. What is distinctive, rather, is its unabashedly moral tone. That tone is a throwback to an era when the nation's charities were concerned not just about the material circumstances of those they helped, but about their character and behavior as well. With the passage of charitable choice, religious service providers were set to play a critical role in translating the coercive imperatives of welfare reform into a comprehensive program of moral and subjective re-education. This, however, was less a throwback to a previous era of private charity than a selective implementation of moral law by the state.